Hello, everybody. How you doing? Happy Father's Day. Am I lagging? Uh oh. I'm gonna tell me if my sound is lagging because it looks like my face is lagging while I'm talking to you. Does it sound okay? Anybody? I have no idea how I'm gonna fix it if it doesn't sound okay. Hope it sounds okay. Somebody, tell me if my mouth is moving with my words. Nobody. Definitely a lag. How do I fix this? Let's see. Test. I don't know how to fix it. I'll try to exit out of some stuff. Maybe this will help. I'm exiting out of some things. I have one other idea. One other idea. I don't know how to change it. All right, well, best we can do. I don't know how to turn it off and put it back on again. I don't know how to, uh, I have to end the stream, it says, in order to, I'm trying to change the audio. I don't know how to do it. So whatever. All right. Oh, good. It's better now. Anyway, let's talk. <clears throat> it's magnet chip. Sorry about that. Two wasted minutes. Magnet chip, super interesting. Okay. So there's there was news last week. Two things that happened last week, or three things, I guess, that happened last week that are all huge. So the first thing was that uh Lots of regulatory things happen. So we were told that uh, CIFUS, C-F-I-U-S, I don't know how you pronounce that, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States is investigating the deal and told them to uh, not close until they're done investigating. We knew they were investigating weeks ago, but they issued an interim order that actually legally binds Magnachip from closing without CIFUS giving its blessing. I'm told this is pretty rare. It doesn't happen that often. The second thing was that Korea officially notified the company saying that you need our blessing in order to close this deal. So obviously both of those aren't good. You know, the, it would definitely seem more likely than not that Wise Road is not going to acquire Magnachip. But maybe they go through the regulatory process and they get comfortable with Wise Road. The second thing that happened last week, or did not happen, was we got through the week period of negotiations with the second bidder, which is uh, the name of the second bidder, the bank is uh, Cornucopia. And Cornucopia, as you know, is also mostly Chinese money. So it would probably have the exact same issues that Wise Road has. And we got through Tuesday night, at Tuesday at 5 p.m., I believe, that was the earliest that Magnachip could deem Cornucopia's bid either superior or reasonably likely to be superior. And crickets, right? No press release for Magnachip, no 8K, nothing. And then finally, on Friday, we got a CTFN article that to me is kind of a game changer, though it's only based on one source familiar with the matter. And that article, I'm gonna work in, in, in arrears. That article says two things in it. The first thing it says that Magnachip's board has become aware of alternative uh, deal partners should the announced bids that are currently known carry too much regulatory risk. And the second thing the article says is that they're still evaluating the Cornucopia deal and it's unknown where they are with that evaluation. Article also goes into depth about the regulatory concerns and about how uh, 
it's really unknown whether or not the U.S. government will end up blocking this deal. I thought it was super interesting that we never got any 8K on Cornucopia. I assumed by the end of Tuesday, either the bid would be deemed um, not credible and not superior, or we would get a press release saying it was. Instead, we got nothing. The company delayed the shareholder vote when they announced the Cyphus news. And they said it's they, they delayed the shareholder vote so that they could evaluate the interim order to see what they want to do next. The stock went down a lot on that, okay? Here's what I think is happening, especially based on the CTFN article on Friday. Once the shareholder vote happens, it makes it much harder for Magnachip to take a superior deal. And I think the company used the interim order as cover to delay the shareholder vote because a lot of people are confused why voting on the deal would have broken the interim order. They're not going to close on it. Nothing's going to close. They, they, they're, allowed, they're legally allowed to hold that shareholder vote, I would think. So why did they delay it? If you believe the CTFN article on Friday, it's because basically the process has reopened you know, in effect. And that source in the article seems to be close to the company. There's another line in the article about how Magnachip was shocked about the CFIAS's uh, interim order. So they clearly are close to the company. What could these alternative deal parties be and how would they look and how would that help with the regulatory issues? This is really complicated. Most of Magnachip's business is in South Korea and China. Virtually none of it's in the United States. If a United States private equity firm were to acquire Magnachip and not pay a premium to the even $35 that another Chinese firm wants to pay, China might be really pissed and China might block the deal in retaliatory fashion because they didn't choose the superior bid, which was Chinese capital. It seems to me the only real way you get a deal through is if you have an anchor South Korean firm, either private equity or strategic, though there really isn't a strategic buyer for Magnachip, though it's so small, LG or Samsung or some, someone could buy it. If you had a private equity firm acquire them domestically, I don't see how the United, the United States definitely wouldn't have a problem with it. And I don't see how China could block that or would block that. I am not aware of any domestic private equity firm acquiring a domestic semiconductor company in any country ever being blocked by any other country, right? So to give you an example, let's say America had a you know $5 billion, $3 billion semiconductor company and KKR wanted to buy it. China's not going to block that, right? And likewise, in this scenario, it would be a, a nothing's leaving the country. And there's no antitrust issues if it's a private equity firm because, of course, they're not acquiring it and merging it with anybody. So the way this article is written to me specifically states that they have alternatives that would make them dodge that regulatory risk. The only thing that could be would be a U.S. bid or a South Korean bid. Now, some people might think, well, does that mean they're going to pay less for it? Maybe take 27 because there's less regulatory risk. And I do not believe that to be the case. I think the math here is pretty straightforward. There was probably less cash than I was saying there would be at a break. I think I was as much as $10. It's probably more like eight to, to 850 because they're actually going to be burning cash this year, not, not accreting based on the CapEx plans, which I was wrong about doesn't really matter. None of this matters. I don't own the stock for a dollar or a dollar fifty difference in the net cash position. But you have a cheap stock that in the last four months 
has gotten cheaper with semiconductor index going higher, though I don't think this thing even trades with the sem semis at all. It's a low correlation. And I think now you are at a holding period where there won't be any negative regulatory news in the next month or two, because we know that Korea is investigating. We know uh, Cyphus is investigating. But now you have this alternative situation happening with the board. And I think it's likely we wake up to another deal in the next few weeks. I'm basing that solely on this article with one source, but it was sourced for a reason or planted for a reason. And I think this is a way of them reopening up the process without getting in trouble with Wise Road. Now, Wise Road is in a weird predicament because they have to pay an 80 or $90 million breakup fee if this gets blocked. But if a superior offer comes in, not only do they save that $90 million, but they get paid $40 million. So, you know, they're, they're not looking to burn money just to burn money. If they're, if they're pretty confident that this is going to get blocked, they're going to work with Magnachip to find a different offer. So they don't have to pay the 90 million in my, in my opinion. Now the cornucopia thing is kind of ridiculous because even if cornucopia would pay $50 a share, they're not going to sign a new definitive agreement with the same kind of breakage stuff if they're just going to have to pay a break fee because they're not going to get this through. Maybe cornucopia is trying to come up with a creative deal structure where the UK based cornucopia is the GP and the Chinese capital are all a bunch of LPs and they're all minorities. So they don't have any control over the company. And maybe that would bless the regulators. Regulators. I don't know. I don't know. But what I do think is that while before my base case scenario was no deal and a dividend recap, and I had like a 20% chance the deal gets the deal closes and a 20% chance there was a white knight. This is before Cornucop Cornucopia got involved. I would now say that I am probably a 50% chance that there is a white knight alternative deal that we have not seen yet. A 15% chance the wise road deal goes through and a 35% chance there's a dividend recap. And I might even be higher on that 50% chance for the white knight outcome based on this article. So yeah, I'm bullish on Magnachip. I think that's pretty much everything with Magnachip for me. I'll take some questions on Magnachip before I go on to Groupon. Any questions on Magnachip? At 24 bucks, if you use, let's just use the $8 for net cash in a break. You have a $16 stock that could do as much as a dollar fifty in earnings next year, somewhere between a buck twenty-five and a buck fifty. So you, you know you, you, you're you, it's growing double digits, bottom line for the years to come. And by the way, you have the United States government and this Korean government. So worried about this company falling into Chinese hands when it's a little billion and a half dollar market cap. If that's not worth more than 10 times earnings, you know, what is? You know, it, it speaks to the high quality of the company that you have an international event based on, you know, it, 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 it being taken out by private uh, Chinese capital. All right, no questions on Magnachip, but we can always come back to it. I'm gonna to move to Groupon. So, you know, Groupon, what's to say about Groupon? Um, I'm incredibly bullish still. The stock's obviously been hit. I continue to believe that the next few quarters are gonna absolutely blow out expectations. And I actually, I did some work on it this weekend to try to give you an example about what I think the numbers could be in the next few quarters. So management guided for this year, I believe like around a hundred million of EBITDA is what management's at. Let me pull it up. They, 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 they hiked it when they blew earnings out of, 
out of the water. And all they did was hike the, the beat. So they didn't actually raise the second half. Their guidance is 110 to 120, okay? And they did 30 in the first quarter. So this is what I did, okay? I was really curious to see, based on the, the language that they told us in quarter one and quarter four, what did they do in 2019 in Q4 2019 and Q1 2019 in gross profit? And what language did they tell us about in Q4 2020 and Q1 2021 about how much they've recovered from the 2019 levels? Amazing. So let's start with Q4 of this year. Sorry, Q4 of 2020. Get the dog out. Ugh. Let's go. Amazing. Get out. Let's go. Oh my gosh, dog. Sorry about that. So they said in Maisie, please. They said in uh, quarter four, when they reported earnings in Q3, in uh, end of October, uh, November 1st or whatever, that the locals business was down 40% from 2019. Okay. And in January and February, it was down 50%, 49%. Okay. They did not tell us what March did, but they told us April was at 70%. Okay. I looked at the quarter one gross profit, which was 155 million. Okay. And in 2019, the quarter one gross profit was 255 million. This is just locals. I'm not, I'm excluding goods because the goods business is very different than it was back then. So I'll repeat that. So they did 255 million in gross profit in quarter one, 2019. And then in 2021, they did 155 million. Okay. That is about 60%. Now you could try to back in to what March was based on knowing that January and February was 51%. It means March was as much as 70%. Now, I don't think March was 70% because if April was 71%, it's unlikely that March, um, Maisie, come here. Let's go. Come on. You're out. Let's go. Get her. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Who could focus when a dog's licking herself for 45 straight minutes? So... It's impossible to know the exact number in March. March is probably closer to 60 or 65%, but the numbers are the numbers. And they recovered to 60% of gross profit in Q1, okay? And they put up a $30 million EBITDA number. They did 13 million of goods. And the total gross profit number in Q1 of this year was 168 million. Now they say for quarter two, they're gonna hike marketing and SG&A is gonna be higher. So what I did was I took marketing from 33 million to 50 million. And I they said goods is going to be less. So goods went from 13 million in gross profit to only 10 million in gross profit in my model. And I decided to say that given April was at 71% already, I moved it to 75% over the course of the entire quarter two. Because May has been better than April and June has been better than May. Okay. If you take 75% of 2019 and you do everything I said, you make it 5 million more for SGNA and you add 17 million more for marketing, which is probably too much, you get to 168 million of gross profit in quarter two versus 155 million in quarter one and EBITDA of north of 35 million versus the company saying that they're going to have a decline in EBITDA from quarter one. And your net income should be well higher than what the street's at. I don't even know how to model 
uh, the adjusted net income that the street uses because there's so many line items. But it should be well, uh, they'll be very profitable. I'd probably be as much as 50 cents in earnings. Okay. I just, just stick with the EBITDA for now, though. That gets you 65 million in quarter one and quarter two in EBITDA alone when the street, when the, they've guided to 110 to 120 for the year. What I then did was in quarter three and quarter four, in quarter three, I decided to use 80% of 2019. And in quarter four, I used 85% of 2019. For quarter three, and then I kept the SGNA 5 million higher. And then I hiked marketing again in Q3 and Q4. I think actually I hiked him 15 million more in Q4 to take it from 50 million to 65 million in marketing. And I did not change the marketing in Q3. Q3, I get 40 million of EBITDA. In Q4, I get I get um, 80 million of EBITDA. For the full year, I get 185 million of EBITDA versus the 110 to 120 they're guiding to. The current market cap is like 1.2 billion and the EV is the same. It's basically trading at like seven times depressed 2021 EBITDA with next year could be as much as 300 million. Yes, that's correct. 300 million. And this is where I show you that it's conservative. So I looked at Q4 2019 and they remember in Q4 2019, they actually missed pretty badly. So this was a depressed quarter based on their business model sucking. And in Q4 2019, they did 270 million of gross profit in local, 30 million in goods. Okay. And EBITDA in Q4 2019 was 84 million. Okay. The company has said if they get to 80% of gross profit in 2019, they'll do 250 million full year EBITDA in a given year. Illustrative of the, of the cost cuts. Okay. For the full year in 2019, they did 227 million of EBITDA. Okay. And they did 84 in Q4. If at 80%, they'd be at 250, then clearly Q4 would be higher than 84, right? If 227 million was the full year number, you'd probably be about 10% higher. So you'd be around 90 to 95 million. Okay. I'm at 80 million and that's at 80, I, what I thought was 85% of 2019. Clearly that's not correct. It's probably closer to 80% of 2019 or maybe even high 70s. Okay. My point is if you do get to 85 or 90% of 2019 this quarter four, your EBITDA number will be well north of 80 million. It could be north of 100 million. Okay. Cheap, cheap stock. Today, if you go to Open Table, you can see that for the first time since the pandemic started, the diner seat seated uh, numbers are higher than they were in 2019 this week. And if you look at the way they were in Q1 and Q4 and Q3, it loosely tracked what Groupon's percent of local business was. Now, Groupon will be the first one to tell you that restaurants is a very small category for them. And in fact, I did an IR call with Groupon uh, with another firm last week, and I can share with you some of the things I learned from that. So the, the biggest takeaway from the call was that there's no time frame for when Aaron's going to be made permanent CEO. And they didn't really give me a good explanation about why he's not permanent CEO. Something about they were too busy with COVID, the pandemic, and they weren't able to run a full process maybe. But, you know, they also caveated it with saying that they're not privy to the information. They don't know what exactly what the board is thinking. Well, of course they are privy to that if they want to be privy to that. That's what the whole job is of uh, investor relations. So I do not know what's going on with Groupon and its management team. I'm still very uh, interested to see what happens there. And I firmly believe that once this business shows a recovery, which you should start seeing an inflection as soon as quarter two, but definitely by quarter three, you'll see, you'll see units go up, you'll see customer count go up. And 
it'll be impossible for the street to ignore this because they've never been profitable like this before. After this quarter, when they put up a positive gap net income number, it'll be four consecutive profitable quarters in a row. And when that happens, they're eligible for the S&P 600. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to happen immediately, of course. It might take a year, six months, two years, whatever. But I believe they'll be put in there. And I think once they start, once you get through quarter three and quarter four, they're going to start gushing cash on their new cost structure. And like I guess it'll be impossible to ignore. Uh, and, you know, the story is just going to be awesome. So your risks are that some form of the transition that they're doing permanently impairs their business, whether it's the app rollout, which I think is really good. I have it on my phone or the new business model with the regards to inventory that won't ever, that won't impair their business. It just, it just might not work as in it won't return the company to actual growth, right? There's two buckets of growth here. One is just the COVID bump that gets you either close to 2019 or, how close is the, is the real question? And then do they really start showing year over year improvement looking out to 2023 or 2024? Now that's the billion dollar question. The other thing that I share with Groupon uh, on my call was that, and I think they'll start doing this, I really hope so, is that that 80% and 90% of 2019 is not a goal. That is just illustrative of what they could do on that cost structure if they got back there, their goal is to get past that to 100%, to 110%, to 120%. And I'm hopeful that they fix that slide and that messaging next quarter. And you could see real blue sky numbers. You know, if, if, if at 90%, they're doing 300 million of EBITDA and at 80%, they're doing 250 million of EBITDA. Well, guess what? At 100%, they're probably doing 350. And at 110%, they're probably doing 400. And I think they could get to 110% in 2022. I really do, depending on what we you know what the COVID situation is. So the other last thing about Groupon is when you go to the bottom of their press releases, you can see them give you the, uh, there's a lot of detail on how many units they've sold locally and what the trailing customer count is. And Again, when those numbers start improving, they basically flatlined over the last three quarters, despite them making all this money each quarter. When that starts going up and even approaching, coming close to approaching 2019 levels, you're going to see profitability explode. And again, I think that will start happening as soon as this quarter. I really do. So I'm as big with Groupon as I've ever been. I know a lot of call spreads. I'm, in, I'm as big in Magnetship as I've ever been. Um, you know, I like them. I like them a lot. They, they're, both, they're both by far my biggest positions. Huge. But, you know, there's a lot of risk in both of them. With Magnachip, your biggest risk there, of course, is that nothing happens and they have to do some sort of dividend recap. But I don't think I lose money there. So to me, that one is very de risk at this price point. Groupon, you could wake up to a quarter where they disappoint. And if they disappoint, then my thesis is kind of bunk, right? I mean, if they don't, if if the, if the if the economy reopens, and they still put up really bad numbers, it's going to take a lot more than adding a little inventory to get them back on a trajectory to where you make a lot of money. And now, and and that black swan outcome is definitely possible any quarter. I think it's very unlikely, but that's your risk with Groupon. Any quarter, you could wake up to what basically happened in Q4 2019 when the stock went down 50% because it showed an acceleration of customer losses and, uh, and, and unit declines. And that's what people are afraid about. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Any questions before I go on to purging? More Nora, please. If you're right about Groupon, they are beyond sandbacking. Why? This is just another way of losing credibility. I'll see if it bothers me. So I told that to them on the call last week, Glenn. I said, your sandbagging is not believed by anybody. 
You can see the kind of numbers you put up in Q1 and Q4 and Q3, and you sandbag all of them. And it's very obvious that these numbers are too low. And I implored them starting quarter two to give reasonable, accurate guidance for quarter three and quarter four. And they were just kind of silent. I didn't say I was, I wasn't looking for them to acknowledge that what I was saying was true, but the silence was deafening. And I think you got to give them a little bit of credit or not credit, but cautionism, respect their cautionism because this is company, all companies that are coming out of COVID have a lot of uncertainty, but in this situation, you're dealing with a company that blew up right before COVID stock was down 50%. They fired the CEO, they fired their CFO, they fired 40% of their staff and I think that they want to set themselves up for success. And the best way to do that is to basically give, you know, very manageable guidance that is, you know, basically impossible to miss. And I think buy side is pretty aware of that. I mean, like I said, you can just run through the numbers I just ran through and you get to 175 million of EBITDA versus the 110 to 120 they're guiding. So, Let's see what they do in August. Let's see what they do regarding guidance and let's see what they do regarding the CEO situation. You know, I'll remind everybody that there still has been no insider trading, buys or sales in the stock in a year. So my gut tells me they're trying to turn this around, get some stability, show some customer growth and sell the company. This kind of thing would work better behind closed doors. If you were in public, you could ramp marketing spend, run it for break even, and really, really push in to the business change model. And that's what you would do, right? You would, you would run it for break even, spend a lot of money on marketing, try to rebrand Groupon, also just have lots of customer acquisition costs and, you know, get the top line up and then take a public as a growth stock in theory. I know that seems like ridiculous that that could happen with Groupon, but it could. So yeah, I'll, I'll be concerned if a dog wants to come in. Oh, wait, come on. I'll be concerned if August, they don't fix the guidance a little bit and oh. Oh, and um, um, we, if we get by the, if we get through the summer and there's still no permanent CEO, it's really just unthinkable. I mean, at that point, it's been 18 months and clearly they can run a process. You know, they hired two new employees in, Jan in January, a chief revenue officer and a chief marketing officer. And they also put a job for chief of staff to the CEO Last month, they have a new job, uh, executive assistant to the CEO. These are not the kind of jobs you hire for an interim CEO, right? The new CEO would want to have want to take these jobs on. So it's my belief that he is permanent. I can't come up with the reason why they won't name him permanent. It's not for money reasons. So, you know, we'll just have to watch it and see what happens. Okay, and let's move on to Pershing real quick. I don't have a lot to say about Pershing. The only trade I have on in PSTH, and I'm pretty big in it, is I am effectively short 2250 August and 2250 September puts. I was long the stock with buy rights, but I wrote 2250 calls against all of it. So I'm also short like 35 calls and 40 calls too. I'm not worried about that. I really like this trade. It's really the only trade I like. Basically, if you if you short August 2250. PSTH puts, you're bringing in $1.10. The stock is 2280 or was 2280 when I started this thing. What's it at now? Yeah, 2277. And it's 60 day duration. And it's a 5% gross return from here. And your break even would be 2140 versus the 2280 it's at now. At a 5% gross return, it's 30% annualized. To figure that out, it's 60 days. 60 times six is 360. It's about 30% annualized. And that's a really good IRR for something that I think is very de-risked, right? The street has absorbed 
this uh, very complex deal. They've obviously put a value on the spark, which is the, the vast majority of the premium. And they're valuing the spark at, let's call it three bucks, two to three bucks. And the street's willing to pay, call it NAV for Remain Co. And they're valuing Universal Music Group at somewhere around where he paid for it. And I have no real interest in owning Universal Music Group. But for me, if you're going to pay me 5% gross and a 30% IRR through August, and it's a little more through September uh, to be involved, um, I'll stay involved. And uh, I don't really have anything more to say about that. I think other people are handling it in a much more detailed manner, like Andrew Walker. And you're probably not going to hear too much about purging from me anymore. Unless he does a deal with Romainco, and then I'll analyze it from there, from that perspective. Any other questions? I'm getting my second COVID shot today. And I'm scared of needles. And I'm terrified of the second COVID shot. So wish me luck there. Any questions on anything? I don't think there's anything else to talk about. All right. Peace. Are you afraid of what the puts might be treated after deal? Great question, Carlos. So no, I, I, I now believe pretty strongly that the puts and the options in PSTH, I believe it pretty strongly will adjust into a basket of four things. Universal Music Group, Spark, Remainco, Remainco Warrants. And uh, I'm not concerned about the most important one of those, by the way, is Spark. If the Spark is not included in the, in the options, then you'd be really hurt by being short puts. I think that's extraordinarily unlikely. It's going to be trading trading on the New York Stock Exchange. It's going to have real value. I can't imagine why OCC would deem that as not part of the unit they have in the past with rights. And this is just another right that's tradable. So no, I'm not worried about it. Maisie is female. Is that, is that question because I was, I was annoyed at her licking herself for the last 45 minutes? <laughs> Where does Doge go from here? <laughs> God. Any new ideas? No. No. I'm just huge in Groupon, Magnachip, IMVT. Um, yeah. And then I still have big positions in BSM and AMPY, but I'm not particularly bullish on either of those. Oh, and I still own Twitter. And I have a decent sized position in Twitter. That's basically my portfolio. Nothing new. Press list is we can apply. There's a Romanco deal is pretty far along. I read that too. I read that as well, Glenn, that it seemed like there is one, but I was also confused by the wording. I thought maybe he was just saying they're actively looking at doing things. I wasn't sure if that was the, if the intention was that there is a target or if they are in a process of identifying targets. They also said they don't expect the deal to be done by the time. I, I can't remember what the words were by the time the spark gets spun off or by the time the warrant exchange happens or something, but all right, I'm going to log off. Good seeing everybody as always. I'll, I'll come back on if anything happens with uh magnet chip, you know, significant basically if there's a new bidder, it really won't be anything regulatory wise, but if there's a new bidder, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pop on to talk about it. But the thing you should focus on if there's a new bidder, is it Korean? Is it American? Obviously, that's what the market's going to focus on. And then they're going to be worried about Chinese approval based on those two things. I don't expect this to happen in the short term. However, the company probably has to uh, disclose any preliminary bid, just like they did with Cornucopia, given the fact they're in a, a definitive agreement with Wise Road. So we could get an indication of interest at any time. I just don't think there'll be a definitive agreement signed, of course, while they're in the middle of a wise road transaction until we get that preliminary interest. Thanks, Flacken. Appreciate it.
All right, everybody, take care. Thanks for, thanks for uh, watching. Bye.